Welcome to our next installment of our Revelation Bible study. Today we're going to be talking about chapters 11, 12, and 13. Let's begin with some prayer. Gracious God, we pray help us to understand the words that John is speaking to the church. The church around the Mediterranean in its early days and the church now to us. We pray write your word upon our hearts and bring discernment and understanding through your spirit. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, so these chapters are filled with symbolism today. We're going to dive right in chapter 11, verses 1 through 14. Then a measuring rod like a staff was given to me. Get up, said a voice, and measure God's temple and the altar and those who are worshiping in it. But leave out the outer court of the temple. Don't measure it. It is given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will give my two witnesses the task of prophesying, clothed in sackcloth, for those 1,260 days. These two are the two olive trees, the two lampstands, which stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, that is how such a person must be killed. These two have authority to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the days of their prophecy. They have the authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with any plague as often as they see fit. When they have completed their testimony, the monster that comes up from the abyss will make war on them and will defeat and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Their bodies will be seen by the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations for three and a half days. They will not allow their bodies to be buried in a tomb. The inhabitants of the earth will celebrate over them and make merry and send presents to one another because these two prophets tormented those who live on earth. After the three and a half days, the spirit of life from God came into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on all who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven, come up here, it said, and they went up to heaven on a cloud with their enemies looking on at that moment there was a huge earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and seven thousand of the people were killed by the earthquake the rest were very much afraid and glorified the god of heaven the second woe has passed the third woe is coming very soon so we saw the first woe in the previous book, and that eagle flew over heaven and warned that the woes are coming. This is the second of the woes. And here we have these two witnesses emerge uh, in the symbolism of our scripture today. Now, this, this is symbol symbolic, okay? So the question becomes, what are the witnesses the symbol for? And why this measuring of the temple and the altar, but not the outer courts? So I think the first thing that we need to take a look at is that this measuring that happens of the temple, this is God saying, all right, it's time for judgment now. Like, I've, I've let the time go on. And as he said in the last chapter, the time is over. All right. So meaning the time of that time of letting this experiment go as far as it can is it's done. God is now going to begin wrapping this up and a measuring line is one of his symbols of judgment. So he's saying that uh, I'm finally going to start issuing judgment. And he notice he starts with the temple. Now the Christians that John were writing to understood that the temple of God was us. The Holy spirit dwells in us. We are the temple of God. So this measuring line that God is doing, where does he start with the measuring? It starts with us, the church. That's a little scary, slightly scary, 
thing to think about there. And he even says, like, so the ones who are in the temple itself, the ones in which who are my temple, you are going, he's going to measure. And, and they're a bit kept uh, from the harm because we see that those outside, those in the outer court, so those might be ones who are saying they go to church or they're saying they're Christian but not living that life out. They are part of the outer courts and God is going to allow the suffering of the nations to happen. We begin to see this theme, which God is doing here, where we're going to see the nations play a part. And there's a reason. God has a reckoning to do with the nations. We're going to see that come in the next chapter. But there's reckoning of the nations is going to happen. God's going to be dealing with them. But first, the nations become the strong arm of which is bringing the suffering in the world. But these two witnesses emerge, and these two witnesses are symbolic, and they stand for the church at large. All right, these two witnesses, they, they come from a theme, um, which John had in his mind most likely of Moses and the escape from Egypt with the plagues. All right, they're, they're escaping the harm. And then we also would think of Elijah, when Elijah runs out into the wilderness to escape the harm that's coming, when the prophets are after him. In both times, it's the, the people that have prophesied a word that the world does not want to receive, which is what it says the witnesses are going to do. They're going to come and they're going to be prophesying, and the world is not going to like it. And they are going to eventually kill these witnesses which is also reminiscent of the prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus. This is what it looks like to walk in the way of God. The world does not care to hear what you have to say. And eventually it wants to kill you. The, that's what it is. And these two witnesses are going to be killed. The church itself, all right? The church, when it prophesies a word, it's not one that the world is going to like. You know, our church today likes having um, celebrities. It likes having well-known people. It likes being a mega church. But that's not what we find brings about the growth of the church. All right? Having celebrities and, and uh, mega churches is not, you, you are preaching a word that the world must like to hear, which means where did you compromise in the gospel? Okay, the, the church grew the most when it was under severe oppression and when the martyrs were giving their lives, right? It grew the most in its first century. When the church has had it easy, we have seen significantly less growth. Just keep that in mind when you think about our world today. All right, so these two witnesses are going to be killed. Their bodies are going to be laid out for three and a half days, reminiscent again of Jesus. Um, and then God is going to breathe life back into them, going to breathe life back into them. And we're going to see that these uh, two witnesses are going to bear out the will and the work of God in this world. Now, they are a symbol for the whole church in its prophetic words, its faithful witness, and its vindication by God. And we are going to prophesy clothed in sackcloth as a sign of mourning for the wickedness in this world and the evil that it brings on itself. Again, that's a bit different than our church today. Think about that. We, we don't like to, we like to dress in our Sunday best. We like our buildings to look fantastic. Um, this idea of putting on sackcloth and ashes and grieving over the world, grieving over choices, or even grieving with another who grieves, we are very uncomfortable with that as a church. We don't like it. It makes us feel weak. It makes us feel vulnerable. Um, we struggle with that. So this is a very different picture of a church than you and I know today. So as we have met these two witnesses it says for three and a half days the world's going to celebrate a victory over the church and then god is going to breathe life back into them 
And what we see here is at the end of this happening, the world starts to be converted. They actually start to recognize God. They actually start to turn and bow down to God. This is the first time we see this in the entire book. And what's fascinating is um, N.T. Wright puts it beautifully here. He says, the martyr witness of the church. In other words, the martyr witness, the sacrificial love of laying our lives down for another will succeed in getting the world to repent where the plagues have failed. The nations come to glorify God when they see the martyrs die for what they believe in and they see God vindicate them. Again, that's a backwards thinking from our world. We think that if we need, we need to convince another person of Jesus. We need to tell it to them. We need to get them to emotionally feel um, horrible about themselves and their sin until they repent. We, we think that if we shout it at people louder, that will somehow get them to convert. And what we see is it is the way of Jesus. It is the way of surrendering and sacrificing and see people seeing sacrificial love that convinces them of who God is. Isn't that beautiful? It's not all the catastrophic events. It's not all the cataclysmic events that happen in the cosmos. It is when another sacrificially loves and God vindicates them that people are convinced of who God is. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Okay. So these... These are powerful pictures, too, for these early Christians about the human condition. John basically says to him here, it's not going to be God coming down with a powerful hand that makes everything right. It's actually when you lay down your lives, you will have the power to bring thousands to know God just by the way you live your life and potentially by the way you give your life. Let's keep reading in verses 15 through 19. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and loud voices were heard from heaven. Now the kingdom of the world had passed to our Lord and his Messiah, said the voices, and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones in God's presence fell on their faces and worshiped God. This is what they said. Almighty Lord, we give you our thanks, who is and who was, because you have taken your power, your great power, and begun to reign. The nations were raging, your anger came down, and with it the time for judging the dead, to give the reward to your servant, the prophets, the holy ones too, and the small and the great, those who fear your name. It is time to destroy the destroyers of the earth. Woo! Okay, so we're back in the throne room uh, for this scene here, and we see that another trumpet is blown and the elders begin giving praise to God. And I want you to take notice in verse 15. Now the kingdom of the world has passed to our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. We tend to have this misconception that the kingdom of God is up there in heaven, and we're waiting for the day when God brings that kingdom to earth. And we get that misconception sometimes from the way we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so we think it's up there and not here. We also think that God's giving people and nations free reign on this earth right now. But the reality is the kingdom is here now. It's on our earth now. It's happening now. And God is saying in this passage, he is going to assume his rightful place. He is going to show the nations who is in charge. And he retakes control. He's always been in control, but he begins to show the nations who is sovereign over them. He takes his rightful place in the kingdom of this world. Not kingdoms, it's not plural. The kingdom of this world. This is also the passage where we get that famous Hallelujah Chorus, part two. It's a beautiful passage. So, they're talking about, you notice they call him Almighty Lord God. We give you thanks who is and who was. And we notice that the yet to come piece is missing. Normally we hear that who is and who was and who is to come. 
but they only say who is and who was. And in this passage, they're talking about that they leave that part off because the future is here now. The yet to come has come. <laughs> they're at that point of the yet to come and God is going to make it happen. And so this is the part where God is going to uh, deal with the nations. So for the early Christians in that moment, this is the thing, part where John is communicating to them, God is going to deal with Rome. He is going to deal with Caesar. He is going to deal with the nation state where you are. And it's not by your fight and it's not by your might that you will beat them. We're going to see in the next passage how that actually happens. But right here we begin to see that God is going to start to deal with the nations. It says God's temple was opened and the Ark of His Covenant appeared inside His temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, thunderclaps, earthquake, and heavy hail. So we again, we get this picture back to what the early Christians would know of the Ark of the Covenant. That was always a sign that God keeps His promises. And so this would be the same thing to those early Christians. It is the mark of we are now in the yet to come point. God's going to deal with the nations and he hasn't forgotten you. He has not forgotten his promises to his people. Very encouraging passage here. Let's keep going. Chapter 12 verses 1 through 6. Then a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and the crown of 12 stars on her head. She was expecting a child. And she cried out in pain, in agony of giving birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns. On its head were seven coronets and its tail swept through a third of the stars out of heaven and threw them down to earth. The dragon stood opposite the woman who was about to give birth so that he could devour her child when it was born. She gave birth to a male child who was going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And the child was snatched away to God and to his throne. The woman, meanwhile, fled into the desert where a place has been prepared for her by God so that she could be looked after there for 1,260 days. Okay, so we begin to see a two, a fi figures emerge here on opposite sides. So we have this woman, and it says she's crowned. Uh, it's very descriptive, and she gives birth to a son who is going to rule the earth with an iron rod. Iron rod. All right, and then it tells us about this dragon that comes again out of the heavens. All right, to destroy things. So one of the first things to notice here is that the, it's kind of a mysterious passage. I kind of wish that we would get a little more labels on it, but that's okay. One of the pieces that's really easily noticeable here is that child who will be born to her, all right, in the midst of strife and will rule with an iron rod and then it's snatched away to heaven. That immediately makes us think of Jesus, right? Born to Virgin Mary in the midst of strife, right? And he's immediately snatched out of the hands of the Rome nation state. And he's also snatched to heaven with death and resurrection to sit with God. All right. So immediately we know the child that's being prophesied and talked about in this passage, this, they're talking about Christ in this plan. So we're beginning to see God's plan has been in motion a long time and it was set before Jesus ever even came on earth to walk amongst us so your immediate brain wants to say the mother is Mary all right your our brains want to make this literal but that's not correct because the woman does not get separated from the sun like that and go out into the desert that's not what happens to Mary the woman here um, that it's being referenced to with the Messiah is going to allude again to Israel and the church, okay? Jesus comes through humanity. He comes through us as human beings. He comes in our line in order to bring salvation. He doesn't just get up off his throne. He has to be born to a human 
born to humanity. So this woman that we see, that it would either be a symbolization for Israel, the nation, the daughter of Zion, something like that. He, he's coming from humanity. Or they believe the uh, other symbol would be Eve. The, essential, the, the point is, the Messiah that's going to be born has to be born in human form, has to come to humanity in order to accomplish the death and resurrection. And he will be reigning with God in heaven. But while this is happening, there is this character of the dragon, all right? And the dragon is a symbol of this nation state, the symbol of the hate and the strife, even in government form, that just wants to kill this Messiah. Okay, it, Rome believes it, does, it should be first. Rome believes that it should have all the power to make the decisions. And it is after the Messiah. And we know it's the, how bad the Roman state was because they actually ended up committing infanticide. They killed off a ton of the children under the age of two, hoping to kill the Messiah. And yet God snatched him away and got his family to go to Egypt. So we begin to see here that this uh, dragon creature, it's created in the heavens, all right? It's in the heavens, and it is talking about it's the powers and the principalities working through the nation states to come after this Messiah character. We see in the end that these characters continue to struggle on. The church is still out in the wilderness like the woman is, still trying to... Uh, fight their way through the strife, still dealing with the dragon, still dealing with the nation state. And But God says at the end, the entire purpose of Christ coming, the entire purpose of the Messiah being born in human form, that it is time to undo the power of evil. It's time to destroy the destroyers. All right. So we see, we'll see the dragon later on and where we learn more about this dragon, but we're just going to kind of leave it there for now. So the woman is the faithful people of God, and they still remain in danger, still dealing with strife. But the Messiah has accomplished his purpose and was snatched away from the dragon. Let's take a look at verses 7 through 18. Then war broke out in heaven. Oh, here we go. War broke out in heaven with Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fighting back. But they could not win, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So the great dragon was thrown down to the earth. The ancient serpent was called the devil and the Satan, who deceives the world. His angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now at last has come salvation and power, the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. The accuser of our family had been thrown down. The one who accuses them before God day and night, they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, because they did not love their lives unto death. So rejoice, you heavens, and all you who live there. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he only has a short time. When the dragon saw that he had been cast down to the earth, he set off in pursuit of the woman who had borne the baby boy. The woman, however, was given a pair of wings from a great eagle so that she could fly away from the presence of the serpent in the desert to take the place where she looked after for a time, two times and half a time. The serpent for its part spat out of its mouth a jet of water like a river after the woman to carry her off with the force of the water. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing up the river, which the dragon had spat out of its mouth. And then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her children those who keep God's commands and the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand beside the sea. Hang on one second here. I just gotta adjust something when I record it. 
So in this passage, we have sort of two battles happening at the same time. We're, we're told about Michael and the angels do battle with this dragon and they kick it out of heaven. Um, and then we're going to see the dragon on earth with the people. But what's fascinating is it says uh, when the war broke out in heaven and the dragon is defeated and kicked out of heaven, it actually says that the, it was won by the people. It was, uh, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony because they did not love their lives to death. This is really powerful. And again, we're going to come back to the same theme that it is sacrificial love that wins the day every single time. So Michael takes up arms in heaven and goes to battle with the dragon. And we're told this is the accuser. This is Satan. There is no mincing words about it. He is labeled here. <laughs> okay. This is Satan himself. And they, he is kicked out of heaven. And what we see here is Christ himself is part of that drama. Christ actually says he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. We know that from scripture. Um, but it is the people on earth doing battle within walking in the way of Christ, along with the angels in heaven, that create this decisive victory. So Satan is kicked out of heaven, all right? Jesus, Messiah, reigns, but the dragon is still roaming around earth. Satan is still roaming around earth here as the accuser, and he is still doing what he can with powers and principalities on this earth to get humanity to love their life so much that they will not lay it down for another, not even for God. And so that is the ongoing battle that you and I have. Two things out of this. First, it's helpful to know that we're in ongoing spiritual battle. All right? We are in ongoing spiritual battle every single day. Every day, Satan is trying to work on you and I to trip us up and to get us to walk in a different way than Christ. All right? It's bad enough that we already sin. But Satan is there like constantly wanting to tempt us to move in a destructive manner. The second piece here is some hope that you and I have far more power than we understand. We are part of that cosmic conquest. We're part of this cosmic drama. Every day we make a choice to live with a sacrificial love. We kick Satan back a notch. We kick him back a notch and we declare and we get victory for heaven every single day day. Now we're going to see that the dragon is going to be dealt with here on earth, but we see this cosmic drama that he's kicked out of heaven, but here on earth, we have the power to beat him simply by walking in a way of sacrificial love, that we do not love our lives unto death, meaning that we don't love our lives so much that we won't lay it down for another. It's that martyrdom sacrificial love that always, always wins. It is not the might. It is not the strength of Jesus coming in on a horse. It is not us um, shouting the gospel at people. It is not us trying to convince them with head knowledge. It is always when they see us live in a sacrificial, loving way. That is when we will see people turn to God. So, the dragon tries to conquer the woman, humanity, and it fails. And so it decides to go after its children, which means the dragon is going to constantly go after the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that. Satan is not going to give up just because maybe our generation um, is able to push him back. Satan will constantly go after generation after generation after generation until God deals with them. Let's uh, keep going here. Uh, in Revelation 13, we'll do verses 1 through 10. Then I saw a monster coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. Each of the ten horns was wearing a coronet, and blasphemous names were written on the heads. The monster I saw was like a leopard, with bear's feet and a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave the monster its power and its throne and great authority. One of the heads appeared to have been slaughtered and killed, but its fatal wounds had been healed. 
the whole earth was awed and astonished by the monster and worshiped the dragon because it had given the monster its authority. They worshiped the monster too. Who is like the monster? They were saying, who can fight against it? And the monster was given a mouth that speaks great blasphemous words and was given authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, to curse his name and his dwelling place. That is those who dwell in heaven. It was granted the right to make war against God's holy people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe and people in language and nation. So everyone who lived on earth worshiped it. Everyone that is, whose name had not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life belonging to the lamb who was slaughtered. If anyone has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, into captivity they will go. And if anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This is a summons for God's holy people to be patient and have faith. So in this chapter, we meet uh, the dragon and he's given even more definition with this. What we see here is this first monster that comes up out of the sea. Might, your translation might say beast. And it has these horns and these heads. And the ten horns wearing this coronet. And each of them we see here, it's got this leopard and bear's feet and lion's mouth. And it's uh, taking power and throne and authority. And one of the things we see here is that this monster is um, a parody of the real thing, right? So Christ is the one who sits on the throne, who has total power and authority. And this monster wants to be that. So this beast that's rising out of the sea wants to be worshipped, wants all the power, wants all the authority. Uh, the coronets on the crowns, that's kind of signifying that it's like the leaders of the nations, it's the leaders of even the local tribes and deities. They are the ones who are, you know, bowing down to this beast and giving it power and authority. And all of the earth is astonished at this beast. All right. And they, the, even the dragon gives authority. To this. So for these early Christians, this beast that's demanding all power and authority, it's demanding that everybody worship it, is the Roman nation state, right? They want people to hail Caesar, worship it at all costs. It is demanding these Christians give their lives to Rome, okay? So it is uh, trying to be the king of this world, but we know that God is the king of the whole kingdom, heaven and earth together. So it says that uh, this monster, this beast utters blasphemies against God, curses his name, even in the dwelling place. Think about that. Curses God in his dwelling place. Where does God dwell? In us. So not only does it curse God, but then it curses us, the people that he dwells in. It's granted the right to make war against God's people. And it'll even defeat us at times. So this beast arises. As God is giving judgment, this other beast arises up. And we see that it wants all of the people's worship, all of their attention. Okay? So it says, you know, for God's holy people, it's calling us to be patient and to have faith. That doesn't seem like much of a recipe and response to a giant beast like this. Oh, just have patience and have faith, right? Doesn't tell us to shout louder. Doesn't tell us to rise up with a sword. Just as patience and faith. Let's talk a little bit about this second beast that comes up, because the two of these go hand in hand. So let's read verses 11 through 18. Then I saw another monster coming up from the earth. And it had two horns like those of the lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It acts in the presence of the first monster and with its full authority. And it makes the earth and those who live on it worship the first monster, whose fatal wound had been healed. 
It performs great signs so that it even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of the people. And it deceives the people who live on earth by the signs which it has been allowed to perform in front of the monster, instructing the earth's inhabitants to make an image of the monster who had the sword wound but was alive. It was allowed to give breath to the monster's image so that the monster's image could speak and it could kill anyone who didn't worship the monster's image. It makes everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves, receive a sign from it, marked on their right hands and on their foreheads, so that nobody can buy or sell unless they have the mark of the name of the monster or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Anyone with a good head on their shoulders should work out the monster's number because the number of the human being, its number is 666. Okay, so the second monster comes up, the second beast, and its job is basically to get everyone to follow the first beast, all right? It's making sure that everybody worships and gives their worship to the first beast. And it, we notice that it's got this special, like, uh, these horns that adorn its head. They kind of represent the local leaders at the time that were trying to build these structures in Rome. They would try to build the biggest temple with Caesar's name on it to get Caesar's attention and favor. They would try to take up a tax and give it to Caesar um, at the marketplace. And what happens for the early Christians is they start having to face some serious dilemmas. All right. So for instance, Rome decided that if you wanted to get into the market, that's where you buy your food, your clothing, or even sell your, you know, if you're a tradesperson, that's your livelihood to be able to sell there at the market. So these local leaders decided that if you wanted to be in the market, you had to go and offer your weekly sacrifices to Caesar at the Roman temple, to the Roman gods. So if a Christian decides they're not going to participate in this sacrifice, and they're barred from being in the market. Think about that. Their very livelihood, their very career, depends on this choice of whether they will bow down to this beast or not. They had money at that time. Rome created coin that not only had Caesar's face on it, but had the title for Caesar of Son of God. So the early Christians had to make a decision. Do we want to use this coinage? Do we want to give our um, validation by using this coinage of Caesar? And it creates this dilemma. When we say we're Christian, how much of our life are we actually going to give to God? And how much do we compromise and give to other idols, other beasts in this world? Maybe the question for us today is, you know, can we work for a company who is um, having goods made by slave labor in other countries? Maybe the question for us is how do we support a company who's polluting the waters around us and destroying creation as part of their everyday mode of operation? So the question of our faith isn't just in our personal life with God. Our question of faith is how we live it out in our choices in the world. That beast wasn't just then. That beast also applies to us now as Christians. As we watch them face these hard choices with the nation state of Rome, how are we going to make choices with the things that demand our worship, the things that demand that we give them a power and authority how are we going to live in a way that actually reflects Christ? You know, this, um, we notice that they talk about that the beast was fatally wounded, but then healed again. And what scholars attribute this to is there was a succession of Caesars with the nation state of Rome. Okay, so there was Augustus, and then um, the heir of Augustus, and then after that was Nero. Nero was a particularly awful Caesar. He treated Christians horribly. Uh, much of the martyrdom of the church happened 
under Nero's rule. That's also when the church grew the most. Where it's again, where we see the martyrs and the dying for our faith tends to grow the church. Nero was particularly awful to the Christians, but when Nero dies, there's no clear heir. And what happens is four people step up to claim Caesar, the title of Caesar, and they start gathering their people together and marching towards Rome to claim power and authority in the throne. In the process, as they are marching on their way towards Rome, they start laying waste to anything that opposes them. And as this happens, one of those people trying to claim power actually destroys the temple in Jerusalem. And so anything that laid in their wake, anything that laid in their midst as they were walking to Rome, including the Christians, they were treated particularly horribly. And people thought that time, that Rome is destroyed. There's no clear air. These people are going to tear apart the empire of Rome in the process. But that ended up not happening. One of them did succeed and did unify the empire again and Rome continued. So a lot of the scholars, when they when you read that part about the beast being having a fatal wound but then was healed, that's what a lot of the scholars attribute it to. Let's talk about the end of this passage here that um, they talk about this mark on the foreheads that they uh, give people to do it. And that is that marketplace thing. You can't enter the marketplace unless you've done the sacrifice to Rome. When you did your daily sacrifices, they actually used to give a mark on the person's body so that they would know whether they could be accepted in. Our modern day version is like when you go to a wedding that has an open bar, sometimes they give you a bracelet like a paper bracelet to put on so they know that you're a drinking age and that it's okay, right? So this is, they had a mark and that's how they would know if somebody was allowed to be in the marketplace or not. Let's talk about this number 666. So it actually says it's a particular human being, all right? This is not, you know, you know hunting everybody down. There is a particular human being and it's well agreed upon that this person is Nero, Caesar Nero, okay? Nero Caesar, however you want to say his name. Um, when you take the Hebrew characters for uh, Nero's name, sorry about that, zoom just, but when you take the Hebrew characters for Nero's name and you do kind of like the A is one, B is two, C is three. When you take the Hebrew alphabet and you do that with Nero's name, Nero Caesar, you will end up with the number 666. So this is uh, well known amongst the Jewish scholars. It's well known amongst those who have studied Revelation that this um, particular uh, monster is, was known to be the head of the Roman nation state Nero. Uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what was going on for those early Christians, I encourage you to do some research on Nero Caesar and to learn about how he treated Christians. Um, there are stories of him putting Christians in cages and burning them alive while crowds cheered. Um, he used to put them in gladiator rings and let the beast tear them apart. So there's some pretty awful, gory things that he did. Um, and that was a huge time of the martyrs. A lot of people had to make decisions about their faith and the consequence cost them their life. So if you wanna take a look at what living out your faith looks like, um, you might wanna research this particular time with the early Christians. John's writing this to them, you know, to tell them this is, this is sort of what's to come, but you're not alone in the middle of it. God is with you in the middle of this. Remember, the woman has escaped, the church has fled the dragon and the beast, and they are still having patience and faith and enduring through the middle of this. So that concludes our time for chapters 11, 12, and 13. And I encourage you for next time to do 14, 15, 16, and 17 for next week. Go ahead and read through those. I look forward to seeing you then. Take care.